Welcome to this DW Business Special asking, are Russia's friends keeping its economy alive and is their support enough to counter the blow of Western sanctions? I'm Kate Ferguson in Berlin and I'm joined today by Professor Jeffrey Sonnenfeld of the Yale School of Management. He's conducted extensive research on the economic impact of President Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Professor Sonnenfeld, good to have you with us again. Thank you, Kate. It's now, an honor to rejoin you folks. Uh, now, Professor Sonnenfeld, Western countries have imposed literally thousands of sanctions against Russia. Which of them have been effective and which have not? Uh, great question. For economic blockades like this to work, there are uh, two categories of, of initiatives. One of them are the actual governmental sanctions, and the others are private sector business decisions. The private sector business decisions, say the 1,020 multinationals, that have completely large multinationals are completely pulled out, plus a couple hundred others that are partially pulled out, is unrivaled in world history. That is extremely effective. It's six times the uh, the withdrawal from uh, South Africa in 1988 uh, in revulsion over the apartheid regime. So that's incredible. On the governmental side, what's always tricky is that the target of the sanctions, in this case, Putin, that case, of course, the South African white leadership uh, in 1988, was they try to make themselves seem like the victims. So it's very hard uh, to rely on them by themselves. Uh, but in this case, some of the very effective sanctions have been in the financial sector and especially uh, strong in energy. Uh, it's it's amazing. Right now, uh, the, the EU, this time last year, half of the EU's gas came from Russia. Now it's maybe 5%, and it could be of no consequence if it went to zero. People would think we were uh, crazy if we said that this time last year. But what Germany has done is that they've accomplished a miracle in China time, in China speed, the projects that were not even dreamed of, let alone on the drawing board, let alone executed, that Germany has built six mega conversion plants for liquefied natural gas coming from all the rest of the world that Germany converts back into vapor form to go through the network of pipelines throughout all of the all of Europe that that is made Europe uh, you know it's uh, independent of Russia which is which is amazing uh, on 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 uh, on gas so 90% of Russia's gas which used to go into the EU has nowhere to go right now similarly on the oil front the oil price caps have been extraordinarily effective. Right now, Russia is losing maybe a dollar or two per barrel on what they sell. Uh, and that's uh, that's not often understood in the press. While Russia is selling more to, to India and China than they did before, they're not making money on it. You can't make it up in the volume. Uh, they're losing because they're such an inefficient oil producer, and it costs them additional month to sell that to India and China in transportation time, uh, that it's um, it's not working for Russia. And that's, again, a great success of the sanctions. What's not working, though, since you guys always push me for the bad news, and I have to be fair and, and honest and tell you, what's disappointing, we're getting an update on this actually uh, uh, later today, is in the aviation industry, there are some parts that are slipping in, uh, it's being smuggled in through certain countries uh, or companies that are helping Aeroflot and their domestic uh, company. Uh, they're not perhaps airworthy by international standards, but those planes wouldn't be flying at all if they weren't getting in some critical supplies. And there also are some chips that, that are being repurposed for military use that are getting in. I'm sorry to say that some of them are our biggest uh, uh, US chip makers uh, are, are look as bad as anybody else here in terms of what's going into some of these drones that we're unraveling that are Iranian drones and others. So. Those are those are some some weaknesses on the apparel front. By the way, we hear sometimes uh, some fashion goods. I think much of that is counterfeit, and even if it's genuine, who cares? All right. Now we're going to be talking a lot more about oil later on. But one way to chart the performance of the Russian economy over the past few months is to look at what the ruble has been doing. And as we can see here, it's been on a downward trajectory, falling 20 percent against the dollar since November. It's currently at its lowest point since shortly after the invasion began. Falling energy revenue, the sale of Western businesses in Russia and increased military spending have all contributed to that decline.
Now that said, a falling ruble isn't necessarily all bad news for Russia. A weaker currency means more competitive exports. And in fact, according to the International Energy Agency's April report, Russian oil exports last month surged their highest level since April 2020. Now, Professor Sonnenfeld, you've already touched on this. Russia might be selling its oil at a discounted price, but it's not short of buyers, is it? No, but it, we would like there to be more buyers. There's, there's no informed party, however... Uh, they feel about uh, President Putin and Russia that wouldn't like to see Russia buy more from uh, 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 to sell more of, of their oil because it, it's keeping the price down in global markets and it is not fueling Putin's war machine because it's being sold so cheaply. It's being sold at or below their break-even price. To be really specific on this, and if your eyes start to glaze over on this, just scream at me, but it costs Russia to extract it $45 a barrel to pull it out of the ground, anywhere from 44 to 46, call it $45 a barrel to extract it. It costs the Saudis and other OPEC nations only $22. Russia is more inefficient than even the obsolete technology of Venezuela. But on top of that $45 a barrel, they have to pay another $12 a barrel to ship it to India and China, the extra 30 days. So to get it to those people that are buying it, they're buying it, at it's costing them we're costing Russia more to produce it than they're making on it. If you were to punch up the price right now and see Russia's oil, which is called Ural's oil, it's you know, 55 or $56 a barrel. The arithmetic on that is pretty simple. Russia is not making money, even if they're selling more of it to India and China. They're losing on it, and that's two-thirds of their exports. A falling ruble does not help any Russian exports. You don't have a single viewer on this call unless they're in, uh, in, the, in Russia that uh, drives a, a Lada or a Skoda car. There are no Russian finished, go finished goods being exported. I would scream that from the mountaintops if it, it wouldn't ruin the tone and decorum of, of this great broadcast. But there's nothing that goes to the, it's only raw materials that Russia is not making money selling. Russia is like a, um, is like a, an old colony in the old mercantile system, They're like a vassal state. They sell food, they sell fuel, and they sell metals. Now we see that these metals are being sourced uh, more efficiently and cheap and safely in Africa. They've helped exploit the mar uh, develop the markets in, in Africa and South in, in South America, and increasing even in North America for metals. Um, and in agriculture, it's been a bumper crop, a boom agriculture year for everywhere except some uh, some uh, water uh, uh, savage uh, parts of, of of sadly of Africa. Is everybody else has had a bumper crop of excess wheat fertilizer uh, and agriculture? The prices are falling because the supply is so great on the global market. We just need to get more of it to Africa, but that uh, that's not helping Russia's hand. Uh, so a falling ruble is not good for them. But I tell you what, it's even worse, Kat is that that ruble is not an exchange traded, traded currency. So that's the best number that Putin can invent. It, it's, it, it, there is no exchange traded a ruble. He's I do have to cut in there, though, and ask you about that OPEC decision to cut oil output. Surely this will be a boost to the Russian economy. You know, uh, if you'd asked me this in the fall, I, I would have been there agreeing with you, saying, I'm so mad, I'm so frustrated. And it didn't happen in the fall when they tried this in October. And guess what? It didn't happen a few weeks ago when, when Saudi Arabia tried it, pushed for it then. What happened as a result is uh, uh, the worst that oil got. And there were uh, an oil analysts, when this happened initially, they were saying, uh, I'd say JP Morgan, just among we friends, to name somebody, uh, other, other energy experts were saying, oh, oil is going to rush up to $380 a barrel. Well, where is it right now as we speak? It's $79 a barrel. Uh, and uh, the high yesterday or two days ago was was eighty two dollars a barrel. That's as high as it's gone after the Saudi decision. It it it's it's come we're nowhere near. Uh, and there's some analysts who are saying it's maybe it's going to eventually hit a hundred, but they it hasn't, and it's gone nowhere near this three hundred and eighty that were predicted. So it's actually oil is still lower than it was before the war, despite the Saudis doing this. You say, well, why would that be? It's because the Saudis are bewildered by this too, because they thought they had more influence than they have. But if you take a look at the oil, the OPEC oil producers, none of them are are at their quotas yet. The past quotas, they still have way more capacity uh, to produce, and they need the money. They need the cash. So Venezuela, Nigeria, all these other OPEC nations are saying, oh, even other Gulf Coast nations, Gulf states are saying, you know, by the way, that's all well and good uh, to the Saudis, 
we still need the producers. We need the money. So all the Saudis are doing is cutting their own market share, uh, but they're not doing anything to damage the price. Uh, so we're we're back in the seventies, and that's that's uh, you know uh, even the most um, the most anti-Russian skeptics um, among us would never have guessed that the oil price cap would be this effective, and that the the Saudis' efforts to disappointingly collude with Russia have had no consequence. All right, I want to zone in on India now because it has a deeply entrenched relationship with Russia, one which Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has recently described as unbreakable. As well as buying up huge amounts of cheap Russian oil, it's also in talks to sign a free trade deal with the country. According to the Reuters news agency, the deal would enable Russia to import more than 500 products from India, including cars, aircraft and trains, all key, of course, to maintaining Russia's war efforts. Professor Sonnenfeld, doesn't this undermine the effect of Western sanctions, both on a practical and a psychological level as well? Uh, certainly, you could imagine that there's a danger there. So far, uh, there has been uh, no evidence that it's undercut the sanctions effectively, that they are buying oil. Uh, they, they can't use any more oil. They have their, their stores, their capacity, their tanks are filled. And they say to Russia, tanks a lot, but where else can they put that oil? In their garages, in their sock drawers, in their pockets. I mean, everything's, and they're smart to buy it at these cheap prices. And, and we encourage them to do so. Is the uh, Indian uh, energy minister has recently said to us, uh, uh, so corporate social uh, you know, uh, social responsibility is to, it's, uh, is to get the cheapest oil for the Indian civil, uh, civilians, Indian citizens. And that's what he's doing. And cynics told us uh, back in the uh, as the oil uh, sanctions were coming out, the price caps. They're saying, "Oh, India won't abide by it, and China won't abide by it." But they are, they are. They don't formally sign on, but of course, they're not foolish. They are riding the coattails of this cheaper oil, so they're paying thirty percent less for Russian oil, which is called Ural's oil, than is out there as Brent or WTI crude is as the other oil sources out there. So uh, Russian oil is way cheaper and the Indians are buying this cheap oil, which is not fueling Putin's war machine. It's just keeping the Indian demand down. This is the same for China. It's not driving up global prices as as the numbers that we just discussed show you that uh, the global market is still is still quite relatively cheap. Uh, and uh, India's done nothing there. Now, there are some Indian companies, some large conglomerates that have stopped working with um, with China. So I don't know who uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi thinks is going to produce these vehicles, but there's many have, uh, they're not looking to make, um, uh, to bring spotlights of attention to themselves. But if you go to our list, uh, Yale, uh, it's a free list, by the way, I don't mean advertising it, but Yale Russia list, just type that in, you'll, you'll punch up there, you'll see that quite a number of Indian companies and Chinese companies, by the way, as much as Western companies uh, in many cases have pulled out right as quickly as they did, such as uh, Sinec uh, Peck and uh, 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 and Sinechem have uh, the, some of the largest uh, 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 petrochemical companies in the world, uh, maybe the largest, pulled out immediately after the invasion last year. Same with some of the largest Chinese financial institutions. Uh, and Indians are following, but Chinese financial institutions like Bank of China and ICBC, bigger than any bank that anybody on this call works with, uh, that uh, they've um, completely shut off all lending uh, into into Russia. So, uh, and we're seeing a lot of pressure. And in fact, it was in Delhi, in, in New Delhi, where the G20 recently met and hosted there is where Foreign Minister Lavrov tried to toss out the idea that Ukraine started the war and Ukraine attacked Russia. What did the Indians do? That was met with gales of laughter. He was humiliated. Interesting stuff. Now, we've mentioned before that getting reliable data out of Russia is not always straightforward. And for reporters covering the economy on the ground, doing their job can be a dangerous undertaking. Just last month, Wall Street Journal reporter Ivan Gershkovich was detained in Moscow, accused of spying. Hours before his arrest, he'd co-authored a story with the headline, Russia's economy is starting to come undone. I want to quote from that article now. Moscow is becoming ever more reliant on China, he wrote, threatening to realize long simmering fears of Mos in Moscow of becoming an economic colony of its dominant southern neighbor. 
Professor Sonnenfeld, I've heard you describing Russia as an economic afterthought for China. But be that as it may, it is consciously choosing to keep the Russian economy afloat, isn't it? Xi Jinping didn't have to visit Moscow last month, did he? No, but Xi Jinping is very clever. He's, he wants to see what he can learn. Uh, and uh, he knows that Russia, Russian resources are very helpful to them. Once again, there are no finished goods from Russia going in, into China either. No Lotus or Skoda's cars are going there. The only thing that Russia exports of a finished good nature is cyber terrorism. Nobody wants to buy everything else is raw materials. And that they are they aren't remotely a, 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 an economic superpower. Russia is not an economic superpower. They've completely lost the uh, the economic war, dip, and they're certainly doing badly in diplomatic war and the military war. But the information war is what's a great risk. We'll maybe talk about that later. And with China, uh, it it they do assist in a public relations sense with Russia a little bit. But but what Xi Jinping wants to do is learn what he can and deepen relations around Putin. They would like to uh, still draw on Russian resources that are enormous, the, the raw materials, but they don't need Putin for that. And, and this helps him broaden his relationships and his base and his visibility to the Russians, which is why it was actually a loss to Putin that Xi Jinping went there to deepen those ties instead of having just the singular voice of Putin coming into Beijing. This is good for China, not so good for Russia to, to expand those relationships uh, around Putin. Uh, but that's that's what Xi Jinping is up to, and it's um, uh, it 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 is uh, uh, you know we we just don't see there could be some electronics that follow in the future, but right now we we haven't seen it happen. China has been uh, very supportive; they don't want to suffer the trade reprisals and the and the business exits of any anything near what's happened, of course, to Russia. And I do want and, to talk and by more the way, about that. Yeah, go on. I should I should mention, Catherine, is that if you take a look at even now Russia's major trading part, uh, China's major trading partners, guess who isn't one of them? Russia. Russia isn't number one, number two, number five, number ten, number twelve. No, Russia's way down that list. Uh, the West is at the top of China's trading partners still now today. Uh, but it it helps him to you know to keep a, a, a Russia alive just for the raw materials. But they don't need Putin for that. Right, and I do want to touch more on this question of information warfare because Chinese company TikTok is still operating in Russia. It's got pl there are plenty of accounts circulating promoting pro-Putin propaganda. Um, what 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 can you tell me about that? Well, uh, it um, China is uh, 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 apparently, according to Putin, still trying to get information from Russia. There were recently three very prominent physicists uh, working in the defense industry that that Russian physicists that were arrested for sedition and treason uh, as uh, Putin has accused them of trying to help China. So some of these are papered over. But in fact, uh, definitely Putin is trying to draw information out. And if TikTok happens to be a, a covert source of uh of, inf of data on the Russian population, as it is in other parts of the world, and it's not available in full full force in China f just for those reasons, then um, then that is uh, perhaps another another threat to Russia in the, the Chinese relationship, where Putin is asleep at the switch, not seeing this coming, just like he misjudged the strength of his own military, uh, underestimated the the patriotic unity of the once divisive uh, Ukraine and understanding the force and unity of the West. He's misjudging the cleverness of Xi Jinping, who's far more sophisticated than Putin appreciates. All right. Finally, I would love your take on this. Where do you think sanctions should end? I mean, shouldn't Western powers be better off sanctioning China or indeed India if they really want to hurt the Russian economy? No, they're, they're destroying the Russian economy, as the arrest of Evan Gershkovich, uh, as you mentioned, points out, is what Putin doesn't want is that truth to get out there. The IMF is uh, either consciously, which I doubt, or unconsciously, for who knows what reason, naively parroting Putin's propaganda. We have on tape, which if you had the time, we could show you right now, the top economists of the IMF admitted to us that they do not have China's national income statistics. They are merely taking what number Putin invents for GDP. And the latest one he invented they, that, that and the IMF has, has certified put out there is that Russia's economy will grow 0.7% uh, in this next year. 
outstripping Germany and the UK. That's ludicrous. That's impossible. With the 1,020 major companies pulling out there alone, where that could be easily 20, 30% of Russia's GDP, we've already talked about their exports. Their two-thirds of their exports are energy, and they're losing a half a, a half a million dollars a day in their energy exports. So it's it's impossible. Uh, all Putin is doing is taking the living room furniture and throwing it into a furnace to keep the the economy blazing at all. And uh, and almost 60 percent of his economy is is public sector right now. So he's basically just harvesting the seed corn. He's taking whatever he can take full control of and trying to pay wages to keep his military going. But this is a crumbling economy, as Gershkovitz pointed out. And we were in regular contact with, with uh, Gershkovitz and his colleague uh, up until the, the arrest. He's not arrested truly for espionage. He's arrested for telling the truth. All right, we could talk about this all day, but unfortunately, Professor Sunfeld, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there. It has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for coming back to speak to us. And thank you so much to all of you for watching. Do join us again next time. Until then, from me and the team, it's take care and bye-bye.